Thank you for staying on Joy News Desk with me, Benis Abu Bedun. Our Parliament's Appointments Committee is ready to vet ministers designate for the local government and rural development. Haji Alima Mahama, Trade and Industry, Alan Kudutramant in Agriculture. Uh, no, I beg your pardon, Agriculture is actually tomorrow. Uh, Energy, Boatia Jaku. And also for Foreign Affairs, Shelly Ayoko Bojinao. Uh, my colleague Joseph Opokugako is there. But let's cross over live to Parliament now for the proceeding. Please swear the um, nominee. I, Alan John Kweju Chamating, swear by Almighty God, swear by Almighty God, that the evidence I shall give before this committee, that the evidence I shall give before this committee, touching the matter in issue, touching the matter in issue, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the, and truth. Nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Alan Kwejocha Mateng, you're welcome to the Appointments Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also wish to take the opportunity to express our condolence for the loss of your sister. Appreciated, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And uh, just for the record, we wrote to the police for request on um, confidential report and their return is that there's no criminal record traced to the nominee. I appreciate this, Mr. Chairman. Again, the Internal Revenue has brought a letter clearing you of having uh, discharged your tax obligations. I think I should have announced earlier of all the previous candidates that indeed we do have that information from the police and from the Ghana Revenue authorities. Now, I wish to congratulate you on your nomination as the minister designate for <coughs> trade and industry. Now, I ask you to start by giving us a brief introduction of yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, honorable members. My name, for the avoidance of doubt, is Alan John Kwejo Chiamating. I was born in Kumasi, attended school, primary school in Kumasi, and proceeded to Adisada College in Cape Coast for my ordinary level studies, and then also to Ashimoto School in Accra for my advanced level studies. I then went on to the University of Ghana, Ligon Red Economics, uh, graduated with an honors degree in economics, started my professional career uh, with Unilever, uh, that's UAC Ghana at that time. And whilst working with um, UAC Ghana, I uh, took the opportunity to read law at the University of Ghana, uh, the postgraduate program in law uh, for two years. And then subsequent to that, I did my professional law study at the Ghana Law School and continued with my professional career. Uh, along the line, uh, I was awarded a Fulbright uh, scholarship uh, as a Hubert Humphrey Fellow uh, at the University of Minnesota, where I undertook uh, a one-year executive development uh, program. So that's more on the educational uh, side. In respect of the professional career, as I've already indicated, I started my career with UAC of Ghana, held various senior managerial positions. Uh, I then moved on uh, as a principal consultant with the Management Development and Productivity Institute. Um, and then after that, I was recruited by UNDP to start a new program 
called Empitech, which is an enterprise support program, entrepreneurship program in Ghana. Um, I did that for a couple of years, and the UN then decided that I should use what I did in Ghana and transfer the experience and best practice to other parts of Africa. So I was appointed as the regional director for Enterprise Africa, and I helped set up about 13 enterprise support programs uh, all over the uh, continent. And in 2001... Mr. Chairman, if uh, I may request the nominee now to focus on his public political life. Public political life. Very well. Um, I was appointed. I was appointed as ambassador to the United States of America in 2001. Uh, for two years, I I served in that capacity. Came back to Ghana as minister responsible for trade and industry and the presidential special initiatives uh, until 2007 when I resigned to contest for our presidential uh, primaries. So basically, that, that, that is the scope of my you contested, life. You contested the uh, two presidential primaries as? In fact, three. Yeah, as, as what? In what, in what capacity did you contest? I, I contested in the presidential primaries in our party. For the position of? To contest for the position ah. of becoming the flag bearer of our party. Is the ambition still alive? <laughs> Uh, the, the chairman, yeah, honorable, you're, you're out of order, please. <laughs> All right, we will take you through your CV, the specifics, so that the questions relating to CV. Chairman, probably the Honorable Okujato would lead. Mine is just page three. Leadership positions held. For your own purposes, you've decided to qualify under paragraph five. Pass, 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 pass. Whether Chairman will not indulge you. It would have been worthwhile if you just said you are a member of Governing Board of Enterprise Africa in the period. But to qualify all of it as pass pass uh, may not be conveying the information you want to share with us. Maybe let me yield to our black car. But if you want it, pass pass, pass chairman, pass this. Uh, I I think that it gives that gives it even more substance. Thank you. Yes, and I will occupy to black. Most grateful, Chairman, and uh, congratulations and uh, commiserations to the honorable nominee. Thank uh, you. I will begin with the first page, personal profile. We seem to be having an inconsistency here. The communication from His Excellency the President has Mr. Alan Kwejo Chairman Tim. Your CV has Alan John Kwejo Chermantin. So for our records, consistency, which of these names do we go with? The right construction is what I have on my CV, which is Alan John Kwejo Chermantin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. For a second, I thought that because uh, the country has departed from the Johns to a Nana, so maybe you were trying to hide the john but uh, it's, it's good to note that it is back <laughs> uh, mr chairman on a more serious note i noticed that on page one educational background the nominee omits his basic education he 
begins with his O levels. Is he able to share with this committee your basic education profile? Thank you, Chair. Um, I did uh, six years of primary schooling uh, in Kumasi at the State Experimental uh, School, sat for the common entrance and was admitted to Adisada College at the age of nine years. Most grateful, page two. Your employment history, quite um, general. Um, the organizations you provide, you do not tell us where we can find them. For example, Center for Strategic African Initiatives. We always appreciate the locations. John Young and Associates, you don't tell us where we can locate this um, entity. Same for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, African Trade Policy Center, you don't tell us where. Management Development and Productivity Institute, you don't tell us where. Management Development and Productivity Institute, again, where you were chairman and later senior consultant you don't give us the locations. Can you please help us with the location or address of these organizations? <clears throat> Very well, honorable member. Um, the Center for Strategic African Initiatives is headquartered in Accra, Ghana. Uh, likewise, John Young and Associates. The UNECA is headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, Enterprise Africa, partly in New York, and then subsequently uh, in, in Ghana, Empretech in Ghana, uh, and then MDPI is in Ghana, uh, UAC of Ghana Limited in Ghana, uh, yes, National Service in Ghana. But I, 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 I would make the necessary amendments. Thank you. Please, how about the Management Development and Productivity Institute? Uh, that, that is also in Ghana, Accra, headquartered in Accra. Um, there is a little overlap we would want you to explain. Um, between 1984 and 1988, when you were senior consultant at the Management Development and Productivity Institute, <clears throat> that is the same um, year you provide for your Hubert Humphrey Fellow, 1986 to 1987. Uh, can you please explain what exactly was going on uh, within this period? Thank you, Chair. 1984-1988 um, was the period within which I was still engaged at the MDPI, but I was granted the fellowship within the course of my employment with MDPI. So. Normally, I retain that uh, as the period of employment, because I did actually come back to MDPI. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. On page three, the last page of your CV, the Honorable Minority Leader has indicated that you kindly help us with the specific periods, uh, because this format is uh, quite at variance with the template we provided. And then um, item seven, conferences, capacity building programs attended. Please, we will uh, appeal to you to let us have uh, at least a brief, um, this is a bit too generic, attended numerous conferences and seminars in Europe, North and South America, Asia and Africa, um, a bit too general. Um, so please, if you can uh, look at our template and uh, let us have some specifics. Finally, please uh, <clears throat> have a look at your referees. Um, referee number two, His Excellency Abdullah Jane. I suspect that you are trying to say Dakar. Uh, check the spelling. Uh, it's something else. I don't know if I am right. You're right. The reference is to Dakar. Mr. Chairman, I'm done. I'll cover Chairman, just uh, on conferences and uh, capacity building, having been Minister for Trade and Industry, 
we largely expected that issues of world trade and related uh, conferences would have been part to enrich your CV and many other rules. As trade minister, you probably even checked the free zones. Where can we find that in your CV? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, point appreciated. I, um, I, I, I tried to stay away from listing all these conferences because I've been around for quite a bit of time. And having attended all these conferences, I was finding it difficult to first make a selection of them and then uh, also to try and keep it short. So um, maybe the better thing would have been to just list a couple of them. Uh, just to give an indication of of the examples of the so we'll make the necessary amendments. Uh, Chairman, if the nominee, if for purposes of humility, Minister for Trade and Industry, you probably also were a member of the Economic Management Team of that government. Is that the case? Yes, indeed, it was. Why is it not stated in the CV? Well, um, Mr. Chairman, as I indicated, um, I, I sought not to uh, make it too lengthy a CV, and um, I, I had genuine difficulty in deciding which of them uh, to actually indicate on my CV. Uh, so that, that's the only explanation. Chairman, assuming you have very heavy weights as your referee, Excellency President John Ajekum Kufo Abdullahi, Jenny, very respected diplomat. As you move, we had asked them to profile you and they contradicted what you have. What would be your position on that? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, that's an assumption. <laughs> we, would, we would rather not go into it. Honorable Fifi um, Kote. I'll get back to you. I'll just give me some that, yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. On his CV, I want that's what... Um, yeah. 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 Sorry. I don't have quite a title global. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanted a nominee to assist us. There's a small gap. When you look at Empretech Project Ghana, where it was a national director in October 1990, August 294, between 1991 to 1993, I'm sure you might have engaged in something. You, you did 1991 to 1993. Then when you come to, I think, oh, 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 I'm done. It's okay. I'm clear. Well, uh, Honorable Chief Whip. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, usually I don't come on CV, but something very interesting. Did I hear him say that he goes to Addis Adel at the age of nine? Y yes, that's after my primary school education. What age did you go to primary school? I'm sorry, I'm asking you because even though you say it's on the CV, because yeah. if you arrive, you arrived there at the age of nine, yeah. How old were you when you went to primary school? Well, I went to class one at the age of four. I only responded to it because it was, it was a question that, that was posed. But I went to uh, class one at the age of four. And I went through six years, I sat the common entrance uh, at the age of nine and, and was admitted. So I'm, I'm, to I, I don't know whether I'm hearing you right. You said you went at the age of four. Yes. And you sat... Class one. Uh, you went to class one at age of four. You spent five four, years. Four, five, six, seven. You spent six eight, years in primary school. Nine. Yes. You spent six years. Yes. And then you arrived at the secondary school at nine. Yes. It doesn't add up. Because you went at four, four spent six years. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Six years. Honourable members, order. He can answer, please. Well, my, my, my understanding is that you went to primary one at four. 
So you were four years, then you arrived in primary one. You spent one year in primary one, that sends you to five. Because you spent one year in primary one, so it sends you to five. And then class two takes you to, to no, wait, please. It takes you to six. Class three, it takes you to seven. Class four, it takes you to eight. Class five, it takes you to nine. Class six, it takes you to 10. Because you said you arrived in class one at age four. So you spent one year in class one. So by the time you finished class one, you were five. You couldn't have spent the, if you arrived there at four, as you said, you couldn't have finished class one at the same four. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, an honorable, honorable member, respectfully, it depends on how you count it. But that's exactly what it is. It no, doesn't all start, I'm, it's I'm, not a calendar year. No, so me, all I'm doing is I'm just taking your ways. Yes. I'm just taking your ways. Yeah. Well, for example, if you were born in the month like I was born in October, uh -huh. by the time I'm, say, four, and I arrive in September, in actual sense, I'll not be four, I'll be three. If I start at four, if I say I arrive in September, in that September, I'll not be four, I'll be three, because I'll only be four the following month. But when I look at your date of birth, it tells me that you're also you were also born in October. Is it right? Uh, is it right? Yes, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that uh, so that's right. my worry. I just because you said you arrived in class one at four. Yes. So, but when you were counting, you counted class one the four, which I said with a greater respect. I don't agree with you because by the time you finish class one, you'll be five. No, but. Uh, respectfully, Mr. Chairman, the statement I made was a reference to that I started class one at the age of four. And I said I went into secondary school at the age of nine. So I started at four, which is not disputed. That is what it is. So no, I'm not disputing that. So I'm only if, saying if that based count, on what you are saying, if, if it we was count, not possible for you to arrive in secondary school at nine. Because if you say you, were, you started at four, you finished class one when you were five. You finished class two, you were six. M M finished class three, you will be seven, and on. So you arrive at 10. But anyway, you can move on. I mean, all I wanted was just this clarification. Chairman, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a matter of record, so. All right, Honorable Samzahi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, on personal profile, and our region, the nominee said Anglican and Christian. Do you want to correct it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Member, I said Anglican stroke, Christian, meaning it's a subset of Christianity. That's, that is the intention. That was to convey. That's, it's understandable. Stroke is all. Um, okay. Shall we proceed to uh, the main? The main questions. Um, Honorable nominee, I want to start myself. Um, I have been thinking about what is contained in the MPP manifesto, which has been touted as the basis for transformation, the transformation agenda. If you look at the transformation agenda, it's heavily dependent on what your ministry is set out to do. Can you tell us exactly what it is that makes, should make us believe that if you deliver, we will transform the economy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, as uh, we would all uh, recognize, the title of our manifesto was Change an Agenda for Jobs. Now, the position of our party is that one of the most powerful instruments for creating jobs is industrial transformation. And so the, the, the focus of our agenda for job creation is through industrial transformation. And there are six main pillars of this agenda. First is improving the competitiveness of existing local industries. 
clearly there is value in starting new industries. But we want to look at existing companies, help them to become more competitive. Uh, and so that's the first uh, element of our agenda for industrial transformation. And we are working towards being able to provide a stimulus package for existing industries, which will involve us undertaking a diagnostic study of these companies and identifying exactly what it will take for them to become more competitive. Because we believe that if they are able to enhance their competitiveness, they will be able to create more jobs and also enhance our revenue generation. The second is the One District, One Factory Initiative. We recognize that even if, admittedly, it is useful to support existing companies, we recognize that the concentration of existing industries, either by chance or design, is in the major uh, cities of Ghana. So the One District, One Factory Initiative is designed to do a number of things. First, to create massive employment all over the country. And secondly, to add value to our natural resource base. Thirdly, to identify potential strategic export commodities, which then would help our export revenue uh, generation. Uh, fourthly, also to identify import substitution products that could also help us reduce our um, uh, expenditure, uh, foreign exchange expenditure. Okay. Chairman, if you permitted me, since you are rolling out competitiveness of local industry, what will you be seeking to do and within what timelines? Uh, initially, we would undertake a diagnostic study. Uh, let's take for granted we have 100 companies that we believe are potentially viable but are currently distressed. We, as I sit here now, will not be in a position to determine the specific support that they need to improve their competitiveness. So the starting point is for us to do an audit of these companies, identify exactly what they require to become competitive, and then we'll provide a comprehensive package of support to help them improve their competitiveness. Honorable, we'll be relying on your competence and expertise. What will you roll out mm. as a package to enhance competitiveness? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, even at the risk of sounding competitive, uh, I, I, I'm suggesting that the only way we can come to a determination as to what they require to become competitive is to do a diagnostic study. Uh, some of the companies may only need uh, marketing support. Some may require an infusion of new technology. Some may require uh, additional uh, investment capital. So uh, it, it is important that we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. But just to add, Mr. Chairman, that the important thing is for, uh, for our private sector to appreciate and recognize that the government is committed to making sure that the private sector survives and leads the process of transformation. And that's why we are starting with existing companies. Can you identify for this committee four major interventions you do for the Ghanaian private sector? Elaborate. Uh, first, if the reference is to our previous term of office in government. Uh, is that the understanding or I remember? Both past and into the future, what will you do for the private uh, sector of Ghana? You are free to share your previous, but we are more interested in going forward. First is facilitating access to capital, particularly medium to long-term capital. We all recognize that it is not as if uh, the banks uh, in this country do not provide uh, credit and financing. But we know it is the tenor of the, of the credit that they provide, which is a challenge for our companies. So our first focus will be on facilitating access to medium and long-term capital. It is in this regard 
that we've made a number of commitments. First is to refocus the operations of the National Investment Bank to provide uh, medium to long-term credit. Secondly, we've proposed the establishment of an industrial development fund, which would uh, literally do uh, the same thing. And also, uh, we've, we've talked about reviving and recapitalizing existing uh, financial intermediation that would also do the same thing. Uh, that's only, that's, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Nominee. You've just mentioned capital for the private sector, where you have a government which overcrowds the private sector and a prohibitive interest rate regime. What will you do to improve that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, respectfully, I need clarification. When we say a government that is crowding out, uh, I mean, we are talking about a new government coming into power. So if it is the record of the previous government that we are talking about having crowded out the private sector, then uh, unfortunately I may not be able to respond to that. But what we intend to do, what we intend to do is to make sure that government limits its borrowing from the uh, financial uh, sector, particularly from the banks. Now, once you do that, the banks have literally no option but to increase uh, the delivery of capital uh, uh, to support uh, uh, b businesses. So that's, that's the first thing. Secondly, if we reduce the Treasury bill rates, then it reduces the appetite of banks to lend to government. And that also will release more funds to support uh, uh, private, the private sector. So those are two things that I know uh, we intend to do. OK, can you come back on track? You were telling us how. Um, so that's the for the one district, one factory. It is not a substitute for the stimulus package for existing companies. It is complementing it. The third element is the establishment of a number of strategic anchor industries, including the petrochemical industry, uh, iron and steel industry, an integrated aluminum bauxite industry, um, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, vehicle assembly and automotive industry, uh, and then uh, also, last but not the least, the manufacturing of machinery and equipment and components. Now, the reason why we are focusing on these mega angle industries is because we are talking about transformation. Um, <clears throat> the stimulus package for existing companies will make a contribution. There's no doubt about that. The one to see one factory will make a contribution. But if you are lo looking at transformational change, then you're looking at these anchor industries that would have a fundamental long-lasting effect on our economy. So that is the uh, third component. The fourth component is to now zero in on domestic trade. If we're going to support local industries, then obviously we have to be concerned about how we help them with their domestic trade agenda. And so we'll be looking at a number of interventions helping to improve and modernize uh, domestic retail infrastructure. We all know what has been going on in our, in our markets. Uh, so that's a very important part of what we want to do. We also want to use our local context uh, provisions, legislation, to support uh, the consumption of locally made uh, goods. Now, the fifth component is to promote exports. Again, if we did all that I've talked about, and do not focus on how we expand our export base, will not generate enough foreign exchange to support our local currency. So underpinning all this is a very aggressive program to support export development. I mean, for over a century, we've been relying on cocoa, gold, and timber as our major export crops. And we believe that it is time for us to look at export diversification. And in this regard, we are not going to just look at our export destination that has served us well for many years. 
we're going to concentrate on the continental and regional market. Uh, I'm sure, Mr. Chairman, it will be pleasing for members to note that there's something major going to happen in Africa, which is not yet on the radar of many countries, which is Africa is going to become a common market, um, a, a continental free zone by 2017. So those countries who would take the lead in transforming their productive infrastructure through industrialization, now would have an opportunity to export to the whole of Africa duty-free, quota-free. So that is also the basis for our export uh, program. We will still look at Agua because I think it provides significant opportunities for uh, export revenue generation. And of course, the EPAS is also an opportunity for us to diversify. Last but not the least is business development and uh, investment, particularly in respect of small business uh, promotion. And we are proposing a new entrepreneurship and innovation plan, which would enhance our support to small and medium uh, enterprises. So these are the six strategic pillars underpinning our uh, industrial transformation agenda. If we had time, I could go into more detail. Thank you. One more from me. If I am ready now to join in in the One District, One Factory program, how would I interface with the government? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, the Minister of Trade and Industry has um, committed to the establishment of a technical support group. Now, this technical support group will do a number of things. First, we are going to interface with all the district assemblies, help them identify strategic economic projects which can be designated as district enterprise projects. Again, for purposes of clarification, this may include existing industries that are located already in a particular, in, uh, in a particular district. So that will be the first point of uh, interface. Once we agree with the district assembly, a number of potential projects, we would again, with the help of the district assemblies, identify potential investors or entrepreneurs, hopefully those who come from those uh, uh, districts. And I suspect that in every district in Ghana, it is possible to identify one or two entrepreneurs who are interested in leading uh, the establishment of a commercially viable enterprise in that particular district. And in this regard, uh, our technical support group will be meeting particularly with members of parliament, uh, because even though uh, you, your oversight is over constituencies. Uh, we believe that uh, members of parliament will be a major resource uh, to help support the One District, One Factory initiative. So we'll be having that interaction. Once we get interested potential partners, at this stage, these are only potential partners. Our technical support group will work with these potential partners to develop a business plan. This is all part of the facilitation to be provided by, by government. Now, once the business plan is prepared, it is only at that point that we can determine the exact costs of implementing that uh, particular project. But again, for the avoidance of doubt and just for purposes of clarity, when we talk about a district enterprise project, we are looking at a medium to large scale factory or industrial enterprise that has the potential to fundamentally affect the economy of the district. I'm making this clarification uh, just so that we don't confuse that with our business development agenda, which will support small and micro uh, enterprises. So once the business plan is prepared and we come to an agreement as to what configuration of public-private partnership will be required to move the project forward. The government is very flexible. If it were possible for the private sector, 
investor that we identify to take 100% equity uh, in, in this project, all the better. But we, we hope that government would also, apart from providing additional equity to support a program like this, will provide contribution in kind. Whatever it takes for the government to make sure that this district enterprise is realized, government commits to do that, including infrastructure support, um, access to technology, and so on and so forth. So uh, there will be a secretariat within the ministry that will be the first point of contact of potential investors, district assemblies, um, and any other interested parties. Chairman, I may have a follow-up. Just to paraphrase you, whatever it will take to get it uh, realized, you will do. You have an idea how much it will cost to implement the one factory, one district uh, program? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as I indicated, it is only when a business plan for a particular district enterprise is completed that we'll know the cost. Once we know the cost, we have to come to an agreement with a potential investor what kind of equity, debt proportion, government's contribution that will be desirable. So we are not talking about state enterprises where government says that we are putting X million cities behind a particular project. Thank you. So but how do you intend to finance it? What will be government's role in the financing of those initiatives? In any particular situation where government determines it is desirable to actually invest equity funds in a particular project after consultation with a private sector investor. Um, there is an agreement in principle, and I'm talking about agreement in principle, for government to allocate a certain percentage of the $1 million that is intended now to go to every constituency, a percentage of that to support uh, each particular uh, uh, district. I mean, the details will be worked out. That is one component of how government will support uh, its financial uh, contribution. Secondly, we are talking about viable commercial enterprises. So uh, if government even has to borrow to be able to provide equity to support a private sector investor. Why not? I mean, we, 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 we are able to borrow on the capital markets to fund infrastructure projects, which may not necessarily uh, have commercial returns. So uh, apart from the commitment that we've been making through these uh, funds going to the constituencies, uh, I, am, I am suggesting that uh, we, we would make sure that both from the consolidated fund and from our own innovative ways of raising finance from the capital markets, we'll be able to support uh, the financial requirements of any of these projects. Honorable nominee, congratulations once again. Thank you, Madam. Um, just a follow up on an earlier um, statement that you made that in finding potential, potential investors to partner um, government yes. in providing the one district, one factory, you will set up a secretariat to do that. Yes. I want to ask, how would that secretariat be working with the GIPC, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center? How do you intend to cooperate or collaborate with that center in the performance of that duty? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. A very, very important uh, uh, question. Uh, Honorable member, what we intend to do is to work very closely with the Ghana Investment Promotion Center. Already I talked about the sixth component of our transformation agenda, 
which is business development and investment. And GIPC is one of the institutions that is established to support investment promotion. And so when we work with the district assemblies to identify individuals, it will only complement also efforts of the GIPC who normally would have people going to them interested uh, in supporting investment projects in the country. So that would be one channel or pipeline of potential investors. The other would be from our interaction with the district assemblies. And also, as, as soon as we prepare a business plan for a potential district project, we would organize what we call an investment forum, which will then have uh, all the profiles that have been prepared showcased to potential investors who would be invited. So GIPC potentially will be one of the institutions that would invite investors, potential investors, into this investor forum to discuss the possibility of investing in these companies. So maybe for clarification, if um, the MP for Laura is spearheading uh, a major industrial establishment in in his constituency or district. Why Laura and not Domi Kwabenya? <laughs> and then Domi Kwabenya. Um, our first uh, interface will be with the district assembly to help us identify potential investors. Secondly, we will rely on the MPs to help us identify potential investors. The GIPC will be contacted if they have interests established in identifying projects in any of these districts. And then the investment forum would also be an open forum to attract other investors. Very well. Um, Honorable Yale Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, the nominee has indicated the steps that they want to take to realize the lofty ideals that I be in this book called the Manifesto. I want to find out from him when will the first factories be done? Uh, because some chiefs have already allocated land, <laughs> and you are going to start. <laughs> you are going to start with studies. I want to know when should we expect these one district, one factory, to be realized. Will it be within the four years? That's my question. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think this is a very important clarification that is being sought. And the Chairman, uh, on, on a lighter note, I don't know whether this is uh, permissible uh, on, under the rules of this House. Uh, when we were waiting for the results, uh, of, of the general election. I think somebody who understandably was impatient that the results were not being declared by uh, Madame Charlotte Osei went on radio and said, Madame Osei, if over these last three days you had declared the results, Alan would have built three factories by now. <laughs> now, in, in his own mind, it is one day one factory. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, that's not what we committed to. We were committing, and I, I want to choose my words carefully, we were committing to work with the private sector under a PPP arrangement to establish at least one factory in every district. The reason why I said it's a very important clarification is that the normal gestation period for a new factory will be maybe one and a half years, you know, in some cases two years. In some cases it could be one year. But I want to clarify that our starting point is to look at existing companies that are viable, that potentially could qualify under the criteria of a district enterprise project, and actually support them to become a district enterprise. So, uh, honorable member, 
uh, depending on how things go and the appetite of our members of parliament, our district assemblies, our private sector to work with this program, potentially you could have within a matter of six months a number of district enterprises already underway. Because all these elements of the program that I talked about feed into each other. Once we do the diagnostic study of these existing companies, it is possible that some of them may qualify to become a district enterprise. That is, if they fit the criteria for a district enterprise. So uh, it is difficult to give a specific uh, uh, answer to that. But I can assure you that um, there's a lot of goodwill within the private sector to, to support uh, this particular program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The general idea of one district, one factory, and particularly during the campaign period, the idea was that you have occupied this in the ministry before, and you undertook some development in terms of factories, including the cassava one. Yes, sir. Now, the, again, the impression was created that you have already identified this, and some people started giving uh, names to what type of factory will be at lo uh, what location. Now, you are saying that you are now going to find out Conduct, uh, conduct studies. Uh, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Are you saying that at the time you were promising one factory, one district, no idea about the resource base of each district or government diagnostic study, we show that potentially each district can get a factory. Are you saying that that was not done and now we are going to begin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I think a very important uh, question that helps uh, us provide more clarification. This one district, one factory initiative is actually an initiative that we started during our previous term of office in government and I superintended this particular initiative. Um, by 2007, at least when I was exiting from my position, there were 110 districts at that time. We had done consultations with the district assemblies, identified three projects in each district, done diagnostic studies, prepared business plans, full business plans, had consultations with, I mean, a number of investors, and literally we were on the verge of taking off. Now, all these business plans, 100, and, 100 business plans, 100 business plans had been prepared with the support of the ministry which meant that the national endowments had all been done. So I think that our successor government had the opportunity actually to, to implement uh, what, what had been done. Now, I'm not too sure exactly what the state is now with what was done before. But I take a position that if you prepare the business plan in 2007, and you intend to support, let's say, a particular project, it will only be reasonable that uh, you review the old business plan, at least you have basic information. And if the figures have to be updated, you would do, you do so. But just to confirm, Mr. Chairman, that we've done an extensive study of all the districts, because the 110 districts still encompasses many of the districts that we have now. We have an extensive uh, study undertaken on all these districts, and this was in consultation with the district assemblies. So I think a lot of work has, has, has been done. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you once again. The minister is designated is talking about business development. But uh, among the list of nominees, the president has appointed somebody to be in charge of the business development. How will your ministry work with that uh, new schedule minister? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, as far as my understanding uh, goes, uh, what the president has done is to appoint ministers in the office of the uh, uh, president to do a number of things. Now, in the particular case of Minister for Business Development, my understanding is that because private sector development is at the center of our national development agenda. The president requires one to have a liaison between the implementing uh, ministry, which is the Ministry of Trade and Industry, between the implementing ministry and then the office of, of the president. That's number one. It is perfectly legitimate and understandable for the president to have a general oversight uh, of some of the key initiatives that uh, he is committing to. So a minister for business development, uh, as I think the president has explained, is not the superintending over a ministry. The implementing is done at the sector, at the ministerial level, sector ministry level. And then we have a contact point or a liaison in the office of the president responsible for liaising between the sector ministry and then and then the office of the president. That, that may, is my understanding. Chairman, may, Chairman. I may come with a follow-up. So your understanding of the minister for business development will be largely done of a liaison officer. So for our purposes, which ministry will be responsible for the private sector of Ghana in your consultations with the president? In my consultation with the president, there is clarity that it is the Ministry of Trade and Industry that has primary responsibility for our trade, industrial, investment agenda, uh, and private sector development. And uh, again, uh, j just to further clarify this position, this, this was something that the president said openly to members of the business community even before he made these formal uh, appointments. I have no further indication that he intends to do otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Obi It's not ready. It's not ready. Yeah, no, okay. Then I go to. Oh, title, you took your chance, didn't you? No. Oh, all right. Okay. okay. Title, that's right. Thank you. Um, captains of industry, members of AGI, have made serious complaints about the challenge and difficulties they went through in the previous regime, i.e., where the government is struggling with them in the quest for credits at our local banks, making cost of business so difficult, high taxes, tariffs at the port. Your ministry, from the understanding that we had from Honorable Yosafo Mafo, is one of the economic ministries. And for that matter, with this background that I've given, and your experience in the very ministry that you're going to serve, what are you going to do
to make sure that members within the trade and industry fraternity who have that sort of respite to enable them to uh, produce, create jobs for the teaming youth in our country. So can you share with the committee what exactly in terms of policy direction that you could really bring on board you know, at cabinet level that will facilitate the businesses that we're going to do are going to have that sort of room for them to do better than before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Honorable Member, I think um, part of the response lies in the belly of what I've said before, because all the six uh, components of uh, industrial transformation agenda is really meant to support the private sector. But for emphasis, there are a number of things that the business sector has been worried about. First is general business environment in terms of regulations, even to the extent of how long does this take to, set, to uh, register a business. So there are interventions de designed to improve the regulatory reform, the legal and regulatory reform, which will be part of what the uh, ministry will be engaged in. If you talk about access to land, that is part of the challenge that currently confronts the business sector. Access to energy. We've talked about access to finance. So whether it is in the component that deals with business development and investment or with improving the competitiveness, these are all elements that are meant to help the uh, private sector. Now, unless a particular company comes with a very specific challenge that is not generic, if that is the case, then we are committed as a ministry to provide a direct response to that. Otherwise, what I've described in general is meant to cover every conceivable challenge that the private sector uh, will be uh, more or less uh, complaining about. But just also to add, Mr. Chairman, that on a continuous basis, uh, we believe that it is important for government to dialogue with the private sector, to be able to continuously address challenges as they come, because business is dynamic. And so there's a private sector government dialogue mechanism that will be introduced where the government, uh, particularly the president and senior members of government will have the opportunity of dialoguing with the private sector uh, in, in a structured environment uh, every year. And I think that will give further opportunity for us to determine the needs of the private sector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Gratis Foundation is one of the institutions that falls within your ministry. And my understanding, I'm speaking from my background as a member of the Trade and Industry Committee. Any time budget is read in our consideration stage at committee level, we realize that Gratis Foundation is underfunded. And their target basically is at a small scale level. What are you going to do? In as much as we are looking at the uh, medium term and the large scale, one district, one factory, we must not lose the fact that the small scale, like you said, is equally important. What are you going to do to really support Gratis Foundation so that they can also have the full grounding to uh, speed up the, 